Second Peter chapter 1, verse 16. Now tonight I'm going to bring you a message that I preached part of it here back in about 1985 one time, maybe part another time. That's been seven years ago. Many of you weren't coming to church here at that time. And um, when you got new people coming into church continually, it's hard to, to uh, keep taking everybody else on further and further, but yet still give these something that's just coming in. It's real hard to... It's like a mama serving meals on the table with a big crowd. Of, it's hard to know exactly what to prepare all the time. But I'd like to preach to you tonight about uh, why Christians should study prophecy. And uh, once a Christian ought to know prophecy, the title of the message is Why Give Heed to Prophecy. Why Give Heed to Prophecy. It wasn't too many years ago that Christians were taught, and this idea still prevails among some, that the best thing to do with prophecy was just leave it alone or you'd get messed up. And that was partly justified because they were in such darkness. God put his hand on some men and wrote some books. I would suggest to you tonight, if you would really like to be a student of prophecy, that there are several books that you ought to try to get your hands on. I've had people even tell me, they say, No, sir, Brother Danny, I'm afraid to read anybody's books because I'm afraid I'll get messed up. Now, what they're saying is, I'm afraid to take any man's words about the Bible at all because it might be wrong, so I'm just going to trust my thoughts about the Bible. Well, you might be wrong too. And the truth is, nobody's got it all and nobody is going to figure it all out. And what you've got to do in studying prophecy is, I'll read uh, any book anybody wants to give me by anybody and then I'm going to compare it with my Bible. Then I'm going to pray. Then I'm going to wait about six months before I say I believe this or that. Have you, ever, have you ever, when you first got saved, really found something in the Bible and you thought, glory to God, the Lord showed me something there. And about six months later, read something or hear something preached that just completely blew it out of the water and contradicted it. I've done that many a time. I went, oh, I thought the Lord showed me this or that. And, and the reason that happens is because the Bible is such a vast book. This is a, this is a gold mine we got laying here tonight. Man, this thing, it's, it's not bound. It's limitless. We got the greatest book in the world laying in front of us tonight. Man, this thing is, is un, it, it's unbelievable. It's un, it, it's un, uh, it's uneverythingable. Buddy, there's nothing like the Word of God. And uh, years ago, God put his hand on people, men of God, till the turn of the century. Very few preachers understood very much about prophecy. So when a man come out and started preaching the premillennial coming of Christ, it's like C.I. Schofield, some of them fellas did, a lot of people thought they're compromisers, and it was very unpopular, even in this part of the country, and still is down in Alabama. Very unpopular. And once people get a hold of something, people are scared to death to let go of a tradition because they're afraid they might compromise and be wrong. And that's, that's, really in, that's not a terrible way to be, really, when you think about it. There's nothing wrong with a tradition if it's right. Tradition's a good thing if it's a right tradition. But you've got to get to the place where if the Word of God says something, you're willing to change your tradition or anything to go along with what the Bible says. Now, other men came along. They wrote books. Uh, Clarence Larkin was, uh, they say, ahead of his time. I'd encourage anybody who wants to study prophecy to get Clarence Larkin's book on dispensational truth. It's a, lot, it's a book about this big. I think we probably, we keep them over in the bookstore. I don't know if we've got any right now. But uh, that's the, the best book on just laying it out on future events that you'll ever get a hold of. I'm not saying I agree with him on everything. Uh, some things I disagree with. Uh, but, but he's got a wonderful book. He's got a great book. And uh, we do well to take heed to men that spent their lifetime studying and praying and reading the Word of God. I, I tell you what, boy, his book on the book of Daniel, his book on the spirit world, his book on those things are some amazing things, especially when you consider they were written like 1910 and 1908 and long back in there. It's, it's absolutely amazing. 
Then other men would come out. These men preached that. Old Oliver B. Green, them men come along preaching that stuff. And that began to clear up through the 50s and the 60s. I got saved and I wanted to read the book of Revelation. First time I read the book of Revelation, I could not make one bit of sense out of it. Second time I read the book of Revelation, it made less sense. Third, I got more, the more confused I got. Amen? Was you like that? It made absolutely no sense to me at all. I couldn't tell whether I was holding it upside down or right side up. I'd read about over here and something was, everything was destroyed and then here we went again. Here come another beast. And it went over here and destroyed everything. And, I, and then here the world blew up. I said, what is going on here? Dr. Uh, Peter Ruckman has, as far as I'm concerned, he, what he's done is take Larkin stuff, Schofield stuff, all that, get all of that and then put it t together for our generation. And uh, no doubt he's got the best book on Revelation you'll ever get your hands on. Everybody ought to read that book. If you've not got uh, Ruckman's book on Revelation, he has got, I don't think there's not another book in the world on Revelation that even comes near, that even comes near his book. You say, oh, you're just saying that because he's your friend. No, no, I, I read the other fellow's books and they leave you hanging in the dark. They got the whole book of Revelation, chronological order. The book of Revelation is not in chronological order, it's overlapping. Takes you through the whole tribulation, the second coming of Christ, Four times. Just like the first coming of Christ is pictured four times. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. You read Matthew and say, well, that's over with. Mark, well, here he comes again. See? It's not chronological. Mark starts same time Matthew starts. Luke starts same time Mark starts. John starts. All four of them are four writers writing about the life of Jesus, but only one life. In the tribulation, you go through that picture four times. The, the seals and the vials and the antichrist and the, and the, the uh, trumpets there. And it's pictured the same thing four times. That's good stuff. Dr. Ruckman, as far as I'm concerned, as I said, no, uh, he's combined all these other fellows, got the good out of them, and then put it there and hung with that King James Bible. That's very, very rare and very, very good. We appreciate a lot his labor in what he's done in that. Now look what the Bible says about a Christian and prophecy. Look at verse 16, 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 16. For we have not followed cunningly devised fables when we made known unto you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but were eyewitnesses of his majesty. For he received from God the Father honor and glory when there came such a voice to him from the excellent glory. This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Verse 18. And this voice which came from heaven, we heard when we were with him in the holy mount, the mount of transfiguration. We have also a more sure word of prophecy. Whereunto ye do well that ye take heed. How are we supposed to look at prophecy? As unto a light that shineth in a dark place until the day dawn and the day star arise in your hearts. Verse 20, a little warning. Knowing this first, that no prophecy of the Scripture is of any private interpretation. Hold on there just a second. If all the cults would go by that verse right there, they'd disband and join Baptist churches. <laughs> That's right. I'm serious. You say, you believe, you believe, we're, I don't believe we're perfect, but I believe we've got the right view of the Scripture. If I didn't, I'd quit this and go join whatever I thought did. Amen. Amen? Amen? Now, you know what private interpretation is? Private interpretation is a man laying on his bed one night and he has a dream and suddenly he dreams that the toe on the image of the beast is the Empire State Building. And God has showed it to him. And there's no... You know what I'm saying? That's what's called private interpretation. They fell up there in Michigan and he told his followers he was going to rise from the dead. And they had to make, the law had to make them bury that fellow when he died. They was all waiting on him to rise from the dead. He never did rise from the dead. Finally, somebody in church had a little baby and they said that was him. Honest, he come back. And now a, a woman's their pastor and she believes she's Elijah. 
I think she's either Moses or Elijah one. I can't figure out which. And some guy was sitting in his house watching TV. Really, this is a church still going on in Flint, Michigan. He was sitting on the couch watching TV. While he was watching TV, the Holy Ghost revealed to him that he was Moses. And the lady in the church was Elijah. <laughs> the Lord really reveals a lot to people while they're watching TV. Now, he ain't a bit more Moses than I am, or Elijah than, than she ain't. She ain't Elijah, my soul. You know what that is? That's, that's private interpretation. Verse 21. In other words, when you interpret the Scripture, you just make sure you interpret the Scripture by the Scripture. Give you a little example before I even bring the message tonight. Now, you say, well, Brother Danny, uh, you've done lost me tonight. Well, there's about a, um, 150 other people here tonight that need this, so you just listen and get as much of it as you can. We're a little bit deeper than usual, but you need this once in a while. Uh, did you know that people had Henry Kissinger pegged as the Antichrist? And a lot of people said, I know that Henry Kissinger is the Antichrist. They had Mussolini as the Antichrist. They had Hitler as the Antichrist. Hitler was not the Antichrist. Back several years ago, people were preaching that Henry Kissinger was the Antichrist. His name, Kiss, K-I-S-F. That's what Judas betrayed Christ with. And they found out that his name in some language totaled up to be 666. And all that. You know, I was always scared to fool with that because my, my name might total up to be 666. Yours might. Now, Henry Kissinger may have been a type of the Antichrist, but he ain't the Antichrist, at least not, not yet. As of now, he ain't. I don't believe he is. You know what that is? That's what we call private interpretation. When people try to mix the United States, some of you Bible scholars correct me, but if I'm wrong, but ever since I've been saved, I've heard people try to make the United States in Bible prophecy. I ain't seen it yet. You correct me if I'm wrong. But I've had preachers try to tell me, now this right here represents the United States. You say, well, Brother Danny, something as great as the United States would surely be mentioned in Bible prophecy here. How do you know the United States even going to be here during that tribulation? Amen. Wicked as we are, brother, I wouldn't, I wouldn't doubt the Lord don't blow it to kingdom come. I don't know that, but neither does anybody else. That's what we call private interpretation. For example, if you want to find out who the Antichrist is, did you know the only man that can be, you can say is the Antichrist and let the Scripture back you up is Judas Iscariot? That's the only man. You can't say, well, it's Clinton, you know. Uh, you can't say it's George Bush. You can't say it's Jesse Jackson. That's who he is. No, you can't say that. <laughs> huh? You can't say that. That's private interpretation. So what you've got to do is you've got to let the Bible interpret the Bible. Stay in the Scripture and you can't go wrong. Say, I believe it means this and step your foot out here and somebody will cut it off. As long as you stay in the realm of Scripture, you're okay. Verse 21, For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. As Brother Ed McAbee said, the Holy Ghost got a hold of the head and the heart and the hand of those men. And Brother gave them them words and they pinned them down. Why give heed to prophecy? There's a lot of talk these days, preaching and teaching about books. Matter of fact, we've been flooded with them here in the last year, few years. We've had all the men like Salem, Curvin, and what that other fella that's like that. What's his name? The other guy, just like so. Yeah, Hal Lindsey and all these uh, prophetic teachers and people are writing books on prophecy, writing, fell over here, is writing that the church is going through the tribulation and many, many books are coming off. There's an, there's an ex, uh, explosion of interest in Bible prophecy among Christianity today. Now, there are three ways that a preacher or a Christian can treat this subject of prophecy. Now, you preachers, be sure and get this. There are three ways that you can handle it. Number one, first, you can just ignore it. You can just say, well, I don't understand it. Nobody else don't understand it, so I'm not going to fool with it. And all I'm going to do every week is just preach 
the plan of salvation. That's one view. There's a lot of them that do that. There's, I've had people tell me, they say, Brother Danny, I go to church every Sunday and I can tell you what I'm going to hear. We hear the exact same thing every Sunday. And the reason that is because a lot of preachers are unsure. And really, you're better off not to preach something if you ain't sure about it. But what they're saying is, I can't understand it, so I just choose to ignore it and let God handle it. The only problem you got with that view is that one quarter of the Bible is prophecy. And if you say, I can't understand it, you are actually cheating your congregation out of one-fourth of the Bible teaching that they need. And... Uh, they, they, you know, they get messed up. I heard of one preacher in Florida who said that 40 years ago, you never even heard hardly a sermon on prophecy. And the ones that preach it now are fundamental and missionary minded. There's one way you know it's right. The right crowd is preaching it. Not the, maybe the job of witnesses or something like that. They preached it in the early 1900s, made fools out of their self, and so now they're kind of backing off and leaving it alone. Now, there's a second view. The second view that a preacher would handle prophecy is that he does the total opposite and goes overboard and preaches nothing but prophecy. I've heard somebody say, boy, I like old so-and-so. He's a prophecy preacher. Now, there's nothing wrong with a man preaching prophecy, but I want to tell you, there's three quarters more of the Bible that ought to be preached. And if you hear a man, and every time you hear him, he's talking about the toe on the image, on the third beast, on the, on the left side, on the fourth side, on the second side, on the back. I mean, that's all right once in a while. But every once in a while, you ought to have a good old sermon on gossip. And every now and then, you ought to have a good old sermon on lying. And every now and then, you ought to have a good, good old-fashioned sermon on keeping your thought life clean. And every now and then, you ought to just blast immodesty. And every now and then, you ought to... You see, if, a, if you go to one of these prophecy churches, you're going to walk around, and every time you're going to be more interested in the news than how you, a person lives. And that's what you call going overboard, going overboard the deep end. I've seen them do it. All they talk about is Russia and Gog and Magog and, and Arabia. And I don't ever know what they're talking about or not. Maybe they do. Uh, but I'll tell you what, boy, you know what will get you through the hard time? Somebody talking about Jesus and His glory. Somebody talking about Christ's death on the cross. Some preachers are afraid to preach just the basic fundamentals of that because they don't want to appear uneducated to the people that they're preaching to. And so they go overboard. Now, I like steak. I love steak, don't you? Amen? I like steak. But I do not want steak for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. I, I, don't, I ain't never had enough steak to get tired of it. But I believe I could eat it every day. I believe I could. But I'll tell you what, brother. I, I Honestly, I believe if you give me steak every meal this week, I'd be sick of it for the week's so. over. You don't want just problems. If all I did was take you through series, through series after series after series, of what's going to happen in the Middle East and in Persia... And and in Russia and all that. First thing you know, you begin to think, oh Lord, I dread another Sunday night sermon. There's nothing wrong with that. You just don't want to go to seed on it. The third view, and that is, of course, I believe the correct view, is the type of preacher who tries to preach the whole counsel of God, serve good meals for the sheep to eat, and preaches all the great Bible doctrines, sin, creation, second coming, future, past, and and present. Our text tonight says, prophecy is a light that shineth in a dark place. This world that you and I are living in is a dark world. Thank God tonight we've got a light that tells us which way to go. Thank God we've got just like a flashlight in a dark room. And it's the prophecy of the Word of God. So I believe we'll fit into that third category and do our best to tonight. And I want to give you just about five reasons quickly. Since I've had a long introduction, I'll give a brief message. Five reasons why every Christian ought to study prophecy. Number one, because it will strengthen your faith 
in the Word of God. Prophecy students do have a strong faith. You've got to admit, these people that study a lot of prophecy, buddy, they got faith in the book. You know why? Because they watch that thing come true. You know what? It, you know one reason why I know the Bible is the Word of God? When somebody comes up to me and they say, well, what about the Buddhist? What about the Muhammad? Uh, the, the Muslims? What about the uh, uh, people of Rajneeshas and the Krishnas and the, 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 all of these different religions? They have religious books. What about the Koran? Why do you think the Bible is different from any one of them? I always answer them and try to do that same answer. And that answer is, the reason I know the Bible is different from all them books because that Bible predicts the future and gets it right every single time. And don't miss it. There's one thing that will strengthen your faith in the Word of God is finding out what that prophecy said and watching that prophecy come to pass. Let me give you a little example right quick. About many, many years ago, the city of Babylon in the Old Testament was, was, I mean, absolutely incomparable. No city could compare to Babylon. Fifteen square miles around that thing. We're fifteen miles this way. Fifteen miles that way. Fifteen that way and that way. Perfect square. Eighty-seven feet thick walls surrounded Excuse me, the city of Babylon. Great big towers ever so often where the people would stand down on guard. Great moat would go around that city, kept crocodiles and things in there, alligators. So if somebody tried to invade, they'd be torn to bits before they ever got to the city. The people were secure. They thought nothing could ever happen to them. But God spoke to a prophet by the name of Isaiah. And Isaiah prophesied to Cyrus, who hadn't even been born yet, that Babylon would be destroyed. Several years later, people must have thought he was crazy. Listen to me. People thought Isaiah was crazy. People thought that crazy old Bible Thumper, he's just jealous of that big prosperous city. That old man didn't know what he was talking about. But many, many years later, there was a king named Cyrus. He was over that thing. Then, uh, then old uh, Nebuchadnezzar and them fellas come along. I, Isaiah had prophesied. Belshazzar threw the great feast. And you know what the Medes and the Persians did? They blocked off the river Euphrates that fed that moat. That river went around the other way. The moat dried up. While they was having the big party in there that night, they snuck underneath the wall, came in there, Babylon was destroyed, and that night was Darius the Medes, uh, or the, the um, I'm sorry, uh, Belshazzar the king slain, and Darius the Mede took the throne, and Isaiah's was fulfilled. Everything those prophets said always did come, or will come, to pass. Now Tyre was the New York City of its day. They had ships coming from everywhere, bringing into that great city of Tyre and, and those the city of Roundabout. And you know what God said about it? In 590 B.C., God spoke in Ezekiel, in Ezekiel 26, 4, and Ezekiel 26, 14. Let's turn over there and see what God said. Get your Bible now. Let's look at a little prophecy here. Look over there at it, the book of Ezekiel. It's past Jeremiah, past Lamentation. And look what God said in 590 B.C. Ezekiel 26 and verse number 4. Ezekiel 26 and verse number 4. And they shall destroy the walls of Tyrus and break down her towers. I'll wait on you just a second. See that? God said this in 590 B.C. I'm showing you how you know the Bible's true. 590 B.C., God said, and they shall destroy the walls of Tyrus and break down her towers. Notice this unusual prophecy. I will also scrape her dust from her and make her like the top of a rock. God said about that city, look down there at verse 14, and I will make thee again like the top of a rock. What an unusual prophecy. God made that prophecy through his prophet. 590 B.C. God did not say, I'll just bring her down like he did Babylon. God did not say, I'll just destroy it and knock it down. God said, I'll take her towers, I'll get rid of them, and I'll scrape the dust off of it. He said, I'll wipe it clean where it'll be like you swept a rock off. You won't be able to find one thing left of that great
Lake City. I mean, that was like New York City of that day. Well, guess what happened? Years went by. By the way, God said that city wouldn't be built no more, too. After he did that, years and years went by, and finally Nebuchadnezzar came in and destroyed Tyre, but the ruins remained. you hear me? But you know what? They said, history tells us, that when Alexander the Great built a, had, built a great causeway, years and years went by, Alexander the Great come, he was, the demand for material was so great, he sent and got all of the ruins of Tyre, and the Bible tells us that God said that, and the history books say that Alexander the Great said the demand was so great that he scraped the dust off of the rocks of that city and used it. Just like God said through his prophet. When God makes a word in that book, it will come to pass literally just like God said it would. But you know, God made that statement. It'll be like scraping the dust. And people might say, oh, well, that was figured. If God just meant he's going to blow it up. No, if he said scrape the dust, son, he meant scrape the dust. And it happened. It's real. That's why a Christian ought to study prophecy. It'll strengthen your faith in the Word of God. Let me show you another one. Turn to Ezekiel 29. Ezekiel chapter 29. Here in this Scripture, Ezekiel 29, Ezekiel prophesied again. This time it was about Egypt. Egypt, in the Word of God, at that time was the queen of nations. Egypt, the home of the great pyramids. You know, they never have figured out how them pyramids got built. I think they've, they've got other explanations. And they, they said that, that it would be hard for modern man with his equipment now to build them pyramids in Egypt. Them things been there thousands and thousands of years. They're laid out with that latitude and longitude exactly perfect. You want to get something that'll blow your mind? Maybe I'll preach on it again. I preached on it before, up there in the old building, about how that thing's pointing direct there. It's located right in the center of the earth. Do you know that? That great pyramid, geographically, if you laid all the land mass out solid, that big pyramid right smack in the middle of the, of the land spot, that's where they're planning that big New Year's Eve party for December 31st, 1999. Ain't that going to be something? Ain't that going to be something? But boy, I'll tell you what, Egypt, now listen to me, Egypt was so far ahead of those other nations back then. It was popular for arts and science and the pharaohs and all of this. Notice, God did not prophesy her destruction, but said this, Ezekiel 29 and verse 15. Ezekiel 29 and verse 15. Talking about Egypt, he said, it shall be the basis that means lowest, uh, undeveloped, and, uh, and uh, you know, like uh, behind everybody. It shall be the basis of the kingdoms. Neither shall it exalt itself any more above the nations. For I will diminish them that they shall no more rule over the nation. Notice how accurate God's prophecy is. Now, he said about Tyre, he said they're never going to rise up again, and they had not he said about Egypt, I'm going to knock it down and it'll still be there. It'll just be base among the nations. Look how far the United States is ahead of Egypt now. They were, they were at the pyramids before there was a United States of America. And the Word of God, of course, comes to pass. Let me show you one that ain't happened yet. Revelation chapter 11. Turn to Revelation chapter 11. Now, these are prophecies just like I've showed you. And the two prophecies that I've shown you in the Old Testament is not meant to imply that all the prophecies of the Old Testament have been fulfilled. They have not. The biggest part of them have not been fulfilled. They are yet future. I just want to show you some that have and show you how accurate to the T that the Word of God is in everything that it says. Now, back then, people laughed at them preachers when they preached it. Now, 50, 70, 100 years ago, when a preacher preached Revelation chapter 11, I can understand why they, why they thought it was figurative because 100 years ago, you would have never thought this possible. Revelation chapter 11, verse 3. Revelation 11, 3. And I will give power unto my two witnesses. 
We ain't got time to go into a big Bible study. But if you say, well, Brother Danny, I've heard it said that that was Enoch and Elijah. I've heard it said that that was Enoch and somebody else. I've heard it said, who in the world those two prophets are? I'll just tell you right off, it's Elijah and Moses. Elijah and Moses. How do you know? You know because of what I said a while ago. It's not private interpretation. It's look what your Bible says. Look what your Bible says. Verse 3. I will give power unto my two witnesses. Got it? They shall prophesy a thousand times. 203 score days. 1,260. You know what that is? Or, or, I'm sorry. Three and one half years. There's one man that did that in the Old Testament. His name was Elijah. And Elijah come into the king's house one day and he said, it ain't going to rain for until my word says that it's going to rain three and a half years. And brother, it didn't rain for three and a half years. And the last three and a half years of that tribulation is going to be a repeat with no rain on the earth, and the last of the tribulation will be that great rainstorm that the Old Testament talks about. Now, watch this as we go. Alright, verse three, 4. These are the two olive trees referred to back in the Old Testament, pictured as Moses and Elijah. I think back there in Zechariah, I believe somewhere, somewhere along right down there. And the two candlesticks referred to back in the Old Testament. Run your references on them two fire comes out of their mouth and devours their enemies. And if any man will hurt them, he must in this manner be killed. Have power to shut heaven. I'm sorry, this is still Elijah. That it rain not in the days of the prophecy. Who done that in the Old Testament? Elijah, three and a half years. The days of the prophecy, three and a half years. Look what the rest they can do. And have power over the waters to turn them to blood. Who did that? Moses. And to smite the earth with all plagues. Moses did that. He's the one that brought the plagues on Egypt as oft as they will. Hold it right there just a second. Man said to me one time, he said, Now, Brother Danny, them two of them two prophets in, in, in the book of Revelation have to be Enoch and Elijah. And I said, Why is that? He said, Because Enoch and Elijah are the two men in the Old Testament that did not die. And since the Bible says it's upon a man wants to die, then they're the two that has to come back and die. And that was all he based his reasoning on was that one verse that says upon a man wants to die. Now let me show you something tonight. There's two things wrong with that belief. Number one, it takes out the type of a rapture in the Old Testament. Enoch, there had to be a type of a rapture before the flood in the Old Testament. And Enoch, brother, went up to heaven without dying. That's a pitch. It's a point of man wants to die after this judgment. It's not a doctrine. You say, well, I believe it means that everybody's got to die. What if the Lord come right now? We're going to heaven without ever dying. Amen? What that verse is saying is, that verse is saying is, unless God zapped you out of here, you are going to die. You know how I know it's saying that? Because the rest of the Bible teaches it. Without God zapping you out of here, and he zapped Enoch out. If Enoch came back and died, then he wouldn't be a type of the rapture of the church that goes up and never dies. You say, well, now you've got to come back and die. He's done been back. <laughs> John the Baptist said, ain't that what he said? Don't ask me, I don't understand it. I'm just telling you what he said. I'm telling you what the man said. You say, well, Brother Danny, I don't understand it. I don't either. I'm just telling you what the man said. Jesus said, he said, they, they said, they're going to, they said hey, you say Elijah the prophet's got to come. And Jesus said he's already come and they killed him. You say, well, was it, was it? I don't know. I'm just telling you what Jesus said. Don't ask me to explain that and ask Brother John. I want to tell you what, brother, uh, I want to tell you what, my dear friend, that's some deep stuff, and I enjoy talking and studying about that. But I'll you say, well, Brother Danny, if Elijah come back, that means he's going to die two times. No problem. Lots of people in the Bible die two times. You say, now, it's point on a man wants to die. The widow of Nain's son died again. Lazarus died again. All them people the Lord raised my dad out. You think they're still alive somewhere? They die again. Some people die twice. Once we dread dying once. What if you'd done been dead and had to go through it again? I'll tell you what some of you Bible scholars need to tell us. 
Where was Lazarus during those four days? <laughs> Ooh. That's good stuff, boy, I tell you. That's some good stuff. Well, let's read on here about these guys. They shut up heaven. They smite the earth with flags. Verse 7. When they have finished their testimony, three and a half years, the beast that ascendeth out of the bottomless pit, that's the Antichrist, over there in chapter 13, you'll see him. Uh, where did I get to? Oh, yeah. Shall make war against them and overcome them and kill them. See, they can't do like these people in these nuts nowadays saying, we're overcomers. Praise God, we're overcomers. We can overcome. He's going to overcome them in the tribulation. Right? That's what your book says. And then their dead bodies are going to lie in the street of the great city. What does that mean, preacher? Which spirits we is called Sodom and Egypt? Oh, my soul, that must be New York and Los Angeles. No. Read your Bible. Read your Bible. Read your Bible. Where also our Lord was crucified. Did he? Right, Jerusalem. Let your Bible interpret the Bible. Okay? Verse 9. And they don't even have a mock Christmas, or it will be Christmas. I don't know. Mock Christmas, maybe. And they of the people and kindreds and tongues of the nation shall see their dead bodies three and a half days and a half, and shall not suffer their dead bodies to be put in graves. Lord in mercy. Be like when Kennedy got shot. Keep him out and keep him out and keep him out and keep him out and satellite TV and everybody's going to be over there and they're going to interview this one and interview that one and what are we going to do in the Middle East and European common markets making this decision and that decision while them fellas lay there. Verse 10, and MTV has a big time. And all the people that want to raise Cain, party and live it up, they did this. They that dwell upon the earth shall rejoice over them and make merry. Remember that word I mentioned a while ago about Christmas? That's an odd word to be in that verse there in Revelation, ain't it? And shall send gifts one to another. Because these two prophets tormented them that dwell on the earth. And after three days and a half, the Spirit of life from God entered into them, and they stood upon their feet. And great fear fell upon them which saw them. Oh, let me go ahead and get that next verse. And they heard a great voice from heaven saying unto them, Come up hither. You know what come up hither means? That's a rapture. And they ascended up to heaven in a cloud, and their enemies beheld them. When a preacher preached that a hundred years ago, people thought he was crazy. They said, how can two preachers that are dead lay in the streets of Jerusalem and everybody in the world see them? It's impossible. You don't hear nobody saying it's impossible now? You sat in front of a television set in a barber shop or a home or wherever you sit, and you could see every time one of them scud missiles that Saddam Hussein shot over there toward Jerusalem. And we could sit right here and watch it happening over there. That means you better wait about a thousand years before you start questioning one word that God Almighty said in this book right here. Son, this thing's coming on through. You know what I love about the Bible? It goes right on through regardless of what anybody says, regardless of what anybody does, no matter what any man thinks about it, no matter how many groups try to change it, no matter how they try to go against it, it just goes right on. It's the Word of God, brother. It's the Word of God. My soul, I've got to get to my second point. I said I was going to give you a short message. Secondly, it, it, we, ought to be, we ought to study prophecy because it will help us to understand the Bible. Now, 2 Timothy 2.15 said, Study to show thyself approved unto God a workman that needeth not to be ashamed. Somebody asked me the other day, they said, Brother Danny, how do you learn what you know? They, uh, I get asked that all over the place. First time I go somewhere, I don't know much. I admit that. I don't know much. But they asked me, they said, how did you, how did you uh, learn the Bible? They said, you never went to Bible school? And I said, no, nope, never been a day in my life. They said, well, how did you learn the Bible? I said, well, my goodness, there's books and tapes and camp meetings and sermons going on. It's out there where anybody can get it if you want it. That's the secret. you got to want it. You know what I've done? i got my Bible down. I get them tapes. 
bright, Dr. Ruckman. I'd got every tape I could get my hands on. And when I was going to certify priest in Hickory, I'd pop a tape in the tape player. I'd listen to one going down there and another coming back. I'd done that through Genesis, through Exodus, through Revelation, through Matthew, through, through all those books like that. But I got a hold of everything I can get a hold of. Listen, brother, there's, there's men out there that can teach you the Word of God. There's, there's meetings going on. There's books you can get a hold of. There's good, there are some, believe it or not, good Bible seminaries, good correspondence. I'd encourage anybody to get in. If you're called to preach, get in something like it. Get in a, a correspondence course. Get in a Bible institute. Get in something like that. If you ain't got the discipline, get in something like that. That'll make you discipline and get a hunger for the Word of God. Get it down in your heart. Well, we're going to see some shaky days if the Lord don't come back soon. You've got to know what you believe and why you believe it. You've got to have it settled way, way down deep in your soul. Shallow Christianity won't get you through like you need to go through in this day and night. You know why you need to understand uh, uh, and have a hunger for prophecy? Because the Lord promises to bless you if you'll study it. Look at Revelation chapter 1. Do you know the book of Revelation is only book that you get promised a blessing just for reading it? I remember years ago I got Larkin's book on Daniel and I got my Bible and I studied ever what the Bible said and I'd read what he said. And I'd read what the Bible said, and I'd read what he said. And if I come to something I couldn't understand, I skipped over it and went on that. And it might be a month later, I'd be at a camp meeting somewhere, and some preacher would get up and hit it, and that thing would fall in place. The whole the thing is desire. Desire. He that hunger and thirst after righteousness shall be filled. Now you got to get off the devil's candy. You can't fill your mind and heart with soap operas all week or, or junk all week and still have a hunger for the Word of God. Feed yourself. Feed yourself. Well, look here at Revelation chapter 1, verse 3. Blessed is he that readeth. Hallelujah. Anytime you want a blessing, just get the Revelation out and read it. You say, I can't understand it. It didn't say, blessed is he that understandeth. It said, blessed is he that readeth. They that hear the words of this prophecy keep those things which are written therein for the time is at hand. Right quickly. Let me just give you these other ones right quick and I'll be through. Number three, everybody ought to give heed to prophecy because Jesus Christ condemned people that were ignorant of prophecy. You know, the Lord had some strong words to say about people that didn't know prophecy. I think sometimes we brag about how ignorant we are. We just, we think it's a mark of spirituality not to know nothing. Somehow or another we've associated ignorance with Spirituality. Sometimes it's that way, but there, there's no excuse to stay ignorant. If you've been saved ten years, you ought to know a little bit about something in the Word of God. If you've been saved five years, you ought to know more about that book than somebody that just got in church here recently. You know what blows my mind? You see people come in, and they've been in there a year. Man, they done went through it all and read the Word of God and just growing by leaps and bounds, and other people sit here for years and years and years and never do get anywhere for God goes back to that thing I was talking about a minute ago, about that desire. And you know what I'm doing tonight? I'm getting your appetite up. Some of you can't wait to go out of here and get your book and go home and start digging in some of this stuff. That's what I'm doing here tonight. That's one of the purposes of me preaching this. Jesus said they knew the sky, but did not know the signs of the times, and he called them hypocrites. He said, you guys can see a storm coming, but you don't even realize the time that you're living in. How spiritual you are, he says. You're hypocrites. You can't read the signs of the times. They're lazy, and they use that as an excuse for not studying and brag about their ignorance. And that ain't right. Daniel, you say, well, well, I tell you, I just, I know there's a lot in the Bible, but I can't understand it, so I just throw it down on TV. You know what Daniel, the Bible said Daniel did? Daniel had a vision and sought the meaning of it. That means he didn't understand it, people. And he had to seek to get it. Amen? We've got the complete revelation. The Pharisees didn't have nothing but the Old Testament. And the Lord rebuked them. What's he going to say to us? What's he going to say to our generation? What's he going to say to these people that just get up there and... and, and uh, Get up there and say, This is the day, this is the day that the Lord hath made, that the Lord... And don't know nothing about the Bible. 
There ain't nothing wrong with that song. I know that ain't, but my goodness, man, there's more than that. Did you know this is the day that the Lord hath made really is a prophecy of the day he died on the cross? Actually, if you want to take it, verse 1 it's really speaking of. Hey, man, I want to tell you something tonight. We are going to be in trouble at the judgment seat of Christ. We got books. We've got it available. We've got men that God showed things in the Word of God like the church has never seen before to equip us for what we're facing. We need to get it, boy. We need to get it. You know why people's going to accept the Antichrist when he comes? Because they're ignorant of prophecy. They'll think he's the Christ. Well, it don't matter if you know it or not. As long as your heart's sincere, it do too matter. People are going to take the mark of the beast because they're ignorant of prophecy. You know what the Bible said? In the days of Noah, and they knew not till the and took them all away. Ignorance. People say, what you don't know can't hurt you. That's a lie. What you don't know can kill you. Fourth tonight, I'm gonna just skip I'm skipping most of these. Most of this and just give it just hitting the high spots and I'll close in a minute. Because the study of prophecy brings great spiritual joy. You're not lost in hopeless, nothingness, meaningless world. There's hope. Thomas Carlyle cried out many years ago, Oh, for a word from God! You know, the United Nations in Washington tonight, they'd give anything to hear from a higher power. They're spitting up, uh, setting up those satellite dishes, spending $100 million of our money, sending out a message trying to contact extraterrestrials. They will not believe what the Bible says because the Bible has a moral plant to it, and they're not willing to change their lifestyle. So they're saying, somebody talk to us. Oh, thank God tonight, we know what's coming. I can tell you what's coming in the future. You say, oh, Brother Danny, you're not a politician or a statesman. That's right. I'm gonna tell you, I got a Bible, though, and I believe it, and I can tell you what's going to happen in the future. Here's where it's going to go. I don't care who gets elected. Here's where it's going to go. I don't care who gets shot or who dies or who gets on dope or who gets caught for speeding, brother. Here's the way it's going to go. It's going to get worse and worse and worse and worse. One day a trumpet's going to sound from heaven and everybody's been born again going to leave this world. After that happens, they're going to be up there answering for their deeds done in the body, getting rewards or losing them, one of the two. While down here, there's a man going to take over the world called the Antichrist. It's going to be mass confusion for a while. He's going to step out on the sea. He's going to promise false peace, make a pact with Israel for three and one half years, seven years later. Excuse me. After three and a half years, he will break it, cause them to have the mark. They'll realize it's trick. Run to the wilderness for three and a half years. And Matthew 24 is going to come into effect. Will unto them that be with child and them that give a suck in those days. Then shall be great tribulation. He that shall endure in the end, same shall be saved. All those scriptures are going to come to pass. And then they're going to be out there. About that time, there's going to be somebody come out there and say, Behold, the bridegroom cometh. Go ye out to meet him. Right? Not marry him. Meet him. His bride's with him up there already. He's going to come back on a white stallion. We're going to be behind him. He's going to come down here and set up his kingdom on this earth for 1,000 years. And we're going to be on our honeymoon. We'll marry the Lord Jesus Christ. He's the bridegroom. We are the bride. We will marry him. He's taking us on a 1,000-year honeymoon on a new renovated earth at which the curses have been removed and the devil's on the chain gang for 1,000 years. And at the end of that honeymoon, he's going to say, Darling, you like this honeymoon? And we'll say, It's a nice place to visit. But I wouldn't want to live here forever. And about that time, John said, I saw a new city that you drew us from coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for a husband, and we're going to move into a solid gold city in which we'll live in and in forever and ever and ever and ever and ever. And the leaves of the nation are trees for the healing of the nation. They'll come in and out, find pastor, and forever and ever and ever. Amen. And I ain't a politician. I'm just a Bible-believing Christian. That's what's going to happen. And there's a lot in between. Now, I just said it all in about two minutes. Number five, the last thing. Why a Christian should study prophecy? Because a study of prophecy will help us to live a better Christian life. You know, an atheist has a real problem. 
And the biggest problem an atheist has is, why is it all working out just like the book said it would? This homosexual movement we're seeing today, and it's not by accident, people. The Bible said that would happen. If it wasn't happening, I'd be getting worried. I mean, I hate it is. I'm worried anyway. But I'd be worried if it wasn't happening. Don't that just let you know what Jesus said, as it was in the days of Lot. Who would have ever thought it? Who would have ever thought that you'd see things going down the street that you, honest to goodness, could not tell if it was male? I mean, I mean, it ain't been that many years since I was in high school, brother. And when I was in high school, son, boys, and girls were different. They dressed different. They looked different. They walked different. That ain't been that long ago. Nowadays, son, something weird's going on. You know what? Jesus said that would be happening. That's prophecy. All this immorality. Party. Listen, you go to California, you go to these major cities, they don't think a bit more about spending the night with people they're not married to than when you would, you would drink a cup of coffee. The Lord said, it be that way! The new morality. You know what Rock Hudson said about the new morality? Quote, he said, I think it's great and very healthy. Couldn't have been more wrong, could it? Do what you want, not what other people think you should. <laughs> Boy, I tell you, temptations are on every side. But you know what prophecy will do? It'll help you look for Jesus and help you live right. It'll help you kids live right at school. If you knew you had to stay here another 50 years, you'd think, Lord, I don't know if I can make it. But if you go to school tomorrow thinking Jesus might come today, it'll help you live right and please him. Well, have you made your preparations? I am, I never cease to be amazed at how the Lord deals with me. He's, he's so good to me. I, this thing I'm getting ready on, Christian rock, you, you wouldn't believe the little things. I used to think, man, this is unusual, but it keeps happening, it keeps happening. You would not believe the little things that the Lord has done in the past month to confirm that I'm on the right track on this thing. You wouldn't believe it. Little thing. You say, oh, it's a coincidence. I don't, I don't think so. It happens too much. And it's like the Lord saying, this is the time. It's ready. People need to hear it. They had a group of some Baptist churches. Less than 40 miles from here. They took these kids, they took all these youth directors in there. They said, we're going to have a big youth meeting tonight. We're going to have this group come in. They're going to sing. They're going to entertain your young people. And they said, the first thing we need to tell you youth workers is that you've got to have a new style of music. This is an independent Baptist church. That's probably 40 miles from right here. You've got to have a new style of music for kids. They said, our mistake has been we're giving kids what we like instead of what they like. See it? See? What do you like, kid? And we like rap. So we're going to have Christian rap. You know. It don't take a very smart person to say, Oh, no, Miss Danny. No. I'm going to go you know, No, you ain't going nowhere. Acting like that. <laughs> you ain't going nowhere, big boy. Acting like a fool like that. And you don't, I think I know why rap is so popular. Son, you don't even have to be able to carry a tune. And I said, Lord, just said, you're on the right track, boy. You're on the right track. Just keep a hitting on that same nail. And I've had a rough time. I sent off a bunch of slides, and they come back, and it's out of focus. And we're going to do it November 15th, Lord willing, and things ain't, oh boy, oh boy, is it going to be controversial. And I still believe, and I've always believed, and God had not given me no reason to believe otherwise, that when you go down the road and pass a church, that you're supposed to hear a different sound coming from a church house than you are a honky-tonk. Yeah. Amen? Yeah. There's supposed to be a difference, people. When you hear a Christian go down the road in his car, there should be a different sound coming out of that car. There should be. People say, music don't matter, it's just lyrics. That can't be right. That cannot be right. What if we come out here next Sunday morning and all of a sudden, you know, here we started and the choir started getting down. It don't matter how much they said Jesus. 
it'd be a wicked display of flesh and it would it wouldn't honor God. I don't care how much I said Jesus. Oh, you just raise that way and you're not open the chain lock. Well, believe what you want to, buddy. Believe what you want to. But there's supposed to be a difference between rock and roll and gospel. There always has been. Rock singers. I'm going to give you quotes on November 15th. I'll give you quotes where rock singers got better sense than that. They say it's supposed to be different. This prophecy that we're still talking about tonight, we know that the water's going to turn to blood. We know that there's hailstones of almost as big as this pulpit going to fall. You, what would that do to an automobile falling out of the sky? That's going to happen. We know there's going to be an earthquake so huge that it levels the mountains. That's the big one, son. That's the big one, brother. <laughs> you start dropping California? Are you kidding? It's going to make Mount Mitchell flat. Now, that's an earthquake. Have you made your preparation? You ready to meet the Lord? You're taking a big chance. If you're not, let's stand by our heads to pray. Every head bowed and every eye closed tonight. Maybe there are those here tonight that say, Preacher, you scared me with all that talk about the coming of the Lord and the prophecy being fulfilled and the rapture of the church. And I tell you, I just don't feel like I'm ready to meet the Lord. Maybe God might be speaking to your heart tonight. You need to come and pray. They're going to get us a song. Maybe Brother John just get us some jubilant song or something like that, whatever he's got picked out. Or we could just rejoice and think about what we got coming. Or maybe we can just sit here tonight and stand here tonight and thank God for being ready. Father, I pray that you'd help every person in here tonight to be ready when that trumpet sounds. Rise to meet you forever and ever and ever. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. I pray you'd bless tonight and help that young man, young lady, boy, girl, get their heart right with thee. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.